currently in school, okay, in school, okay, versus, and how many of you are currently looking for a job? Your boss isn't here, I imagine, okay, good. What I'm going to share with you is some strategies as uh, someone who's run a business for a long time, has been a freelancer myself. I'm mostly focusing on full-time jobs, but these are things that will also work if you're interviewing for part-time work, freelance work, etc. My name is Rich Herring, and uh, I'm the owner of a visual communications company called Red Pixel. We're a full-service company in Washington, D.C. area, and uh, I set out and started my own company when I was, let me guess, do the math. 17 years ago, or 27 years old. A little scary, but kind of became a necessity. Uh, although I had an unfair advantage. I started my career in small market in Long Island, so I was directing live TV and directing commercials by the time I was 23. So I've never been really good at the patient. I got in a lot of trouble in the first jobs, and I didn't understand why people were 15 years sooner to do things that I didn't do. But I found a better gave me some of that control. So it all ultimately worked out. And uh, that's the sort of thing that you sort of got to figure out over time. So I also run a, a full studio and we have outside clients come in. So I see a lot of folks. And what we're focusing on today is how to not screw up a job interview. I'm going to tell you stories and I'm going to share with you practical advice on how to nail this. And uh, not everything will work for every person but it is pretty straightforward advice that should help you get the job done. So first up, one of the things that is important is the job interview. So yes, you need a good demo reel to get the job interview. Yes, you need references or connections or a resume to get the job interview. But this is the finish line. And I gotta tell you that there's people I've brought in for job interviews that I was ready to hire until they opened their friggin' mouth and the attitude came out or the lack of understanding of basic things like copyright came out and it was clear that these people were gonna be an emotional liability, a legal liability, or they just wouldn't fit into our corporate culture. So the point that I say is, is all those other things are important, but if you screw up the job interview, you're not getting the job. It doesn't matter how good everything else was. So I'm gonna give you some strategies on how to stand out, what to do before the interview, what to have with you during the interview, and steps for after the interview so you can plan the job. Okay? So this is pretty important stuff. It's relatively straightforward. Uh, my background, I gave you a little bit of it. I manage, a, I run an online learning community called Think Tap Learn. I publish a website called Photo Focus. I speak at conferences. Uh, we've got a 17-person company. Uh, the website is a 22-person company. So all told, on any given day, I'm interacting with about 40 employees and we're always looking for somebody between one of those two places to hire because ours is a relatively transient industry. So pretty straightforward. And uh, you're welcome to find it. I'm a little bit unique in that I've completed my project management certification and I take a very organized approach to business. So uh, I may sound like a business person, but through and through I'm a creative. I just forced myself through business school, so it would help me with my business. We've done a lot of work through the years for a wide range of clients, from nonprofits to major brands, to trade associations and government agencies. All right, let's jump forward, and you can find me doing one of these outlets. All right, so first up, education is what remains after one has forgotten what one has learned in school. It's a very important quote, and it's very true. You don't stop learning. One of the biggest things that I see happen when I bring in people for jobs is that they've got a nice solid reel, they've got great references, and they're completely outdated. They're doing things the old way. They don't know about trends. Now you've come here to this conference to learn about new things, you've explored the floor. Not everybody's shooting 8K video anytime soon, but you better be at least passingly familiar with 4K. If you're gonna be hired for a crew, you better understand and have shot some log. And if you haven't done it on a job, do it on your own and figure it out. If you're an editor and the last version of Premiere Pro you used was CS6 in school, and we're four versions later now and you haven't used it, I'm not gonna hire you. Unless you come with glowing references and you are amazing, or I already have a personal connection with you from a networking group, I'm not gonna pay you to learn on my dime. I expect you to be current. So, 
getting the interview, a couple things. That's where networking needs to come in. You need to do real world networking, not just social networking. You have to join professional groups. So you're looking here for mentors, you know, finding some real world mentors or people that you work with, professional organizations, TIVA, women in film and video, local user groups, meetup.com is a great way to find small local groups around different professions and interests. This is where things come from. And don't try to connect with the entire room, okay? Don't be the loud person, floating from person to person, quickly handing out your cards or your resumes or asking for jobs. No one is gonna hire you because you asked for a job. I get asked to hire people three or four times a day. People, can, you have any jobs? I'm not gonna tell you. Even if I did, I've got no shortage of applicants. I'm gonna hire people that I've had my eye on for a while. Or the people that I've met at a networking event, like an industry event, or the person that volunteered, you know, that we have something in common with them. So try to connect with people. Yes, exchange business cards, but don't act desperate at these events, even if you are desperate. Okay, when I started my job and started my own company, it was because I had a non-compete agreement from a previous employer. I was miserable and almost divorced because the place worked us about 75 hours a week. I was on the road every other week. We would leave, you know, we would get back from a field job Sunday at 10 o'clock at night. If we weren't in the office Monday at 8 a.m., they docked our pay. It was crazy. Um, I quit. I went out there, I had no connections, not the best way to start a business, but you know, my wife was in grad school, we were broke. I was desperate, but I didn't act desperate and I got to meet people. My second client, for some of you who may be taking classes this week, was Amy DeLuise, who some of you might have worked with. She was the second person who ever hired me when I went freelance. We've known each other for a long time. Um, virtual networking is important, right? It's a small industry, so you want to connect with people. There are people who came to our Premier Pro user group breakfast. You know, about 25 people came out on uh, Monday morning for breakfast. We belong to a Facebook group called Moving to Adobe Premier Pro. Put real names to faces. Got to talk to some people in the real world, but we met first through virtual groups. And there are people that I know in the real world that I meet at conferences that I interact with all year long, virtually, and then we see each other and it's like we still know each other. So when you're online though, it's really, really, really important to act professional. It's very easy to just treat this as people you're not gonna ever see in the real world and say stupid things, and then it comes into the real world and it hurts. If you don't use LinkedIn, use LinkedIn. There's a ton of creative professionals on LinkedIn. There's a ton of decision makers on LinkedIn. The challenge is, is it's not about baseball cards. It's not having the most connections. It's connecting to people you actually know or met, so then when you need connections, you can make it. If you're actively searching for a job, do not use the free version of LinkedIn. Use the paid version, which may sound hard when you're searching for a job, but with the free version, you have to ask somebody to introduce you to somebody that they know. With the paid version, you can reach out directly and say, we have an acquaintance or two in common. I'm not sure if you, you know, how much you interact with these people, but I know so-and-so from such and such group. I don't know if you have any openings available. I was hoping you had some information on me. Or you can discover that your college professor went to school with so-and-so and they put a good word in for you. I'm continually amazed in this industry when I look up somebody, how many people we have in common. It is rare that we don't have at least five connections overlapping. So it's important to build that. So what LinkedIn can do for you is make it a little bit easier to find some of these pieces. Essentially, LinkedIn is a social media site, but it's about business. It came out in 2003, and it's grown. Um, it's pretty big, 46 million folks. They now own lynda.com, which a lot of my content is on. And uh, they work in a lot of different industries. And the goal of LinkedIn is to help people connect. So employers will use it to look for employees or subcontractors, but those who are looking for jobs can actually use it. But it's not just about job hunting. There is a bunch of professional network groups on LinkedIn, and there's a lot of news and information. So joining some of the professional groups on LinkedIn allows you to interact with others in your industry. So I recommend that you make connections and you take a look for people who know people that you know. This is one of the easiest ways to build the network. Look for shared connections, okay? 
You can use this to line up appearances. You can use this to line up interviews. You can use it as a source. I frequently get contacted to contribute to magazines or publications this way. If you use it effectively, I recommend a couple of things. Make sure that you actually do the insights library and that you post stories. So you can make blog posts to LinkedIn and include some of your more business-oriented articles. You also can see fascinating things like who's looking at your profile if you have a paid membership, which companies have been checking you out, which other people are similar to you that have similar interests that maybe you should connect with. You can see what's going on with people in your network, so you can send congratulations notes to people who are succeeding. People can get a pretty detailed profile of you. And you get a constantly updated Rolodex. I work with a lot of people in technology. They typically change companies every two to five years. So it doesn't matter that they left Apple and went to Amazon, and then left Amazon and went to a startup, and then are now back at uh, Avid. Well, I can find them. Because once we're connected, we're connected. So as people move around and their email addresses change, you can find people very easily. And you can even search for people you used to work at at past jobs. Oh, yeah, I got along with that person. You know, that was before. These are people that I worked with before the Internet, believe it or not. Yes, the Internet was there. There was a Mosaic web browser. A couple people had email addresses. We have to used to have to use expensive, dedicated apps to send email within the office. Right? Well, I can find them now. So it's pretty important that you connect. All right, well, let's talk about the types of interviews you can get. There's more than one kind of interview. You can get an interview before there's actually a job to be had. Internship interviews are awesome. If you know you're going to be graduating or you're a recent graduate, you can apply for internships. Now, it's very important that you check about the guidelines that they're paying. And I will let you know a simple fact that unpaid internships are generally illegal. Doesn't mean that they don't happen all the time. Unpaid internships are only legal if you're not actually doing work. If you're simply just shadowing people and observing. If you're in an observational role and you're not taking the place of somebody doing work. Otherwise, they're supposed to pay you the minimum wage. We, if you're doing it for credit, well, then it can be unpaid. We'll typically still give a small stipend to cover travel and other things. Make sure you check how long the internship is going to be for. Internships that don't have a defined end date are basically frequently using people to just fill spots. If you're not working in the office and they call it an internship, you use your own computer and edit video at home for them, it's an internship, that's bullshit. Okay, the whole experience is to go in and meet people and build connections and learn how to work in a professional environment. I have had many internships as a student. One of my best internships turned into my second job. So after I almost got fired from the first job, I got hired by the number one TV station in town. And when I interviewed for the job, I could only do three of the ten things they were asking. But I had interned at that TV station as a student. Now, I was a dumb college student. I mean, I was not stupid. I had good grades, but I didn't like actually watching the news. I wasn't that interested in news, even though I was a broadcast news major. I was more interested in radio. But then I started getting attracted to TV. And I was always busy. We had athletic practice at the time when the news was on. So I never watched it. But I was interning. And I made friends, but at the time I didn't know it was a 5 o'clock anchor, a 6 o'clock anchor, who both were REM fans. And we talked about music. And I did work for the weather person. My job was to call up every small town in Iowa to make a physical calendar of local community events. What a boring job. I got a copies out of it. I got a small stipend. My instructor, my instructor said, take this internship. It's at a good place. So when I went in and took the interview, after I just got being done told that I was completely unqualified for the job, but the man said, well, let's just give you a quick tour of the station. Ten people said hello to me. And, oh, it's good to see you again. Are you going to be, you know, are you going to be working here in internship? The next day, the call gets, well, everybody that knows you, likes you, trusts you, so we'll teach you everything else. But it didn't matter that I didn't have a good job. They brought me in because they knew I didn't show up on time. And then I had a good attitude. And then I got the job done that I was given. 
So one of the things, that's one of the biggest parts. I can teach people skills. I can't teach people to be professional. I can teach people skills, but I can't teach them to show up to work on time. So those are some of the things that get hard. So those interview interviews, or those uh, internship interviews are good. Informational interviews are also fine. I don't have a lot of time, but if someone shows potential or they're a friend of a friend and they want to do an informational interview where we don't actually have a job, but I'll interview them like we were applying for a job, I'll find out about them, I'll let them practice the interview. My rule is I usually say, you buy me lunch and you'll get an hour of my time. It's really simple. Uh, but I'll do this for friends of friends or people that I meet at networking groups who I can see potential in. And I'll file them away as if we do have something in the future, I might contact them. Or I might contact them for freelance work. But this is a way to find out. Now, people are pretty busy, so you're not going to get a ton of these, but if you, can, you can always ask. Freelance interviews are pretty important, though. Easiest way into a company is as a freelancer. Every company is going to have overflow situations. Every company is going to need people to help out on evening shifts and weekend shifts and vacation shifts. There's always a foot in the door. So if you just say, I want to get on your freelance database, and you put into your thing, I'm open for freelance work or part-time work, it's fine. And they might say, are you looking for full-time work? Well, I'd consider it, even if that's what you really want. <laughs> of course, well, I'd consider it as the polite way of saying, hell yes and you can get your foot in the door. This is one of the most important things, but being organized is essential. They want to see that you've got a clean, organized path for that job and that you're gonna show up on time for the interview, you're gonna be ready to go, you're gonna make sure that you have everything, that you are professional across the board, because the last thing people wanna do is bring in a freelancer that's more difficult to deal with than an employee. Freelancers are expected to be better than employees, more self-sufficient, more independent. Part-time interview is fine. Be open to part-time work. We frequently hire part-timers for seasonal work or hiring people for short-term contracts. Hey, we know going in, this is a contract position. It is a three-month job. If you do this a lot, and part of the thing with that part-time is going in and treating you as an independent contractor, they don't want to pay you benefits and they don't want to pay unemployment if you get fired or laid off. So these, this is another easy way in. Just make sure that this is ethical. There are places that will keep people on three-month renewals and they're on year six of their three-month renewals. I don't agree with that. I do agree that just like retail stores need extra help around the holidays, there is seasonal work for production. And then, of course, full-time interviews. So one of the things I always recommend with full-time interviews is try to find out information, right? Are they really hiring? You know, I'll even ask. I'll say, okay, I'm happy to interview. Is this for an immediate opening, or are you interviewing for future growth? Oh, well, we're expecting to land a big contract, and we just want to add people into our roster so we can hire next year. Or no, you know, we're screwed. Uh, you know, our previous person was totally unprofessional. They just accepted a new job and we're backed up. We need somebody tomorrow. And that, here's the dangerous thing. What's very difficult there, like if you find yourself and they're in a crunched position, like for one reason or another, they have an immediate opening, do not, under any circumstances, give your previous employer less than two weeks' notice. What you can say to the new employer is, well, I'm sure you can appreciate that I want to give my previous employer notice. If they don't need me and I can transition over, I'll come over sooner. I'm also happy to see if I can shift my schedule around. Maybe I can log 15 or 20 hours right away a week for these two weeks transition. And I'm happy to come in and work a later shift or come in a little early and I'll see what I can do so we can start the training and orientation process. But you might actually fail the test if you say, oh yeah, I'll just tell my previous employer I'll be available tomorrow. Well, then you show that you're not a loyal employee and that you are a shark. And it's a good way to not hold up. All right, any questions on anything I've said so far? We're going to go into the actual resume next. Yes?
somebody else. Right. And then work from that side to somebody else. A connection is a connection. So if you've worked with a different department within a building, you can often jump ship. Uh, you know, a reference is a reference. So when given a choice, people work with people they like and respect. So it is less about your high-end skills and more about you as a person for most jobs to get a full-time job. People don't realize there's an abundance of skilled professionals out there. There is no shortage of people who know how to use a software tool or how to shoot video. What there's a shortage of is people who are professional, who I can count on, who I would put in front of one of my clients and not be embarrassed by. So it's the people skills that matter more. If you're a freelancer, then it's expected that you're at the top of your game and you're a hired gun and you're a surgeon or a precision instrument that drops in and solves things. But for most full-time or even part-time jobs, it is less about the technical skills and more about the people skills. All right, on the resume side, a couple things. You wanna make sure that you know the purpose of the resume. Don't only have one resume. Is this your freelance resume? Is this your full-time resume? Is this your resume for applying for a hybrid job or your production and post? Or are you just applying for a post-only job? I see a lot of resumes that are very lazy. And if I'm hiring for an editor, I don't want to see a resume filled with your skills about shooting. If you want to list additional skills somewhere bottom at the resume, or you want to bring it up in the job interview, that's fine. But if I'm hiring a video editor, I don't want to see you know, all this stuff about shooting. So you may play up. If you had a job that you did both at, you might have one resume that plays up one set of strengths versus the other. So you want to balance it. Also, don't tell me the job title, you know, oh, I was a level two assistant. Describe the position. You know, I was an assistant editor. I was a, uh, you know, member of the technical crew for the evening news. You know, I was a crew member. Use plain English definitions. Proofread it at least twice and always let somebody else look at it. I also use bullet points. Bullet points are easier to scan as opposed to paragraphs of text, short to the point things. And always front load it with the most important information up front. If you're applying for a job in this industry, typography matters. Choose readable fonts, use mixed weights. Don't just use a bad word template. And make sure you explain the benefits of your skills, why these skills matter. Also, particularly if you're looking for a job and you're mad at your current employer, don't come off as negative. No one likes to marry the recently divorced person. Okay? If you are bitter and angry, the current employer is just going to say, well, they have a lot of baggage. Doesn't mean be bubbly and enthusiastic, just be professional. You can also not be an expert in everything. Okay? I'm an expert in some things. I've written 40 books on video and photography. I am crap at 3D animation. I will never try to pretend that I can animate 3D. I can't code. Don't be an expert in anything. Be honest. Be, if, you're, if the employer says, okay, you've got all these skills here, list them in order of best to worst. You better be prepared to list them in order of best to worst. And you're going to come off even better if you say, well, that's the order that I listed them on the resume. Oh, well, thank you for being honest with me. So this whole web page thing down here, yeah, my, at two jobs ago, I had to do some WordPress updates. I've got basic WordPress skills. I know how to create blog posts and upload content. So if you need me to do any of that, I know how to build posts and such, but I don't know how to install plugins. I can't be a system administrator, but I do know how to use the system. Okay, that's much better than just saying WordPress. Well, tell me, what can you do in WordPress? Well, I know how to be an author in WordPress. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. It's not like Comic Sans, but you know, yes. pick something that has a little bit of character. Okay. There's an abundance of great free fonts out there. I always recommend font families. Google Fonts, if you're an Adobe customer, you got Typekit. Look for a family that has multiple weights. Okay. And I usually prefer sans serif fonts, uh, a little cleaner and easier to read, in my opinion, but pick something that matches your personality without being over the top. Okay. Do not put pictures in your resume. Do not allude to your age or even your sex if you can avoid it because it's illegal for the employer to know that information. Now, there's not a lot of women named Richard. 
But I don't need to put all of that information in there about my age. Listing your college graduation dates is fine, because people go to college at all sorts of different ages. You can list the dates of the career, but you should not list your birth date. Make one resume for each employer. Look at your resume, look at the job application, and customize the resume to the job application. I cannot tell you how many generic resumes I get. And cover letters are even worse. People who have copy and paste errors, they use the wrong name, I get something sent to me addressed to Susan or with some other company name in it. If you want the job, write it, you know, take your resume, open it up and edit it so that the order of things, the listing of skills and your past experience makes you look like the best candidate. Now I didn't say lie, I said edit your information, remove the irrelevant stuff and emphasize the stuff that's relevant. Does that make sense to everyone? I gotta tell you, there's a lot of people who apply for jobs that clearly don't want the job that I have to offer. They just want a job. I want someone who wants the job that I have to offer. So if it's a graphic designer job, I don't wanna hear about their editing experience. It's fine under additional skills, but I wanna know that they're a graphic designer. If you're coming out of school, I want to, and you're interested in graphic design, I want that. I don't want you to hi apply for the graphic designer job because you want to get a foot in my, job, in my office so that you can get a job shooting in our studio. I'm not going to hire you. I will think less of you. So apply for the job that you want. If your resume is more than one page, you better be over 40 years old. If you're over 40 years old and it's over two pages, you better be receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Edit. If I, if I get a two-page resume, I'm usually skeptical. And that doesn't mean your cover letter or your references. That just means the facts. Get the good stuff out there. Update it regularly. Make sure that there's white space. Don't jam it filled with text. On your cover letter, you want to make sure that you make a unique cover letter for each position. Do not copy and paste. Don't use search and replace. Be very specific about why you want this job. Research the company and tell them why you think your experiences would fit with their corporate culture. So if they mostly work on industrials, don't talk about how you want to be a filmmaker. If they mostly do broadcast television, don't talk about how you're an independent web producer, unless that's the job you're applying for. Focus on what they want. Any questions on resumes or cover letters before we go forward? Yes? Uh, cover letters. Uh, just how much, how much do you avoid the reputation from your resume and how much is you know, highlighting experiences rather than relevant? Uh, I, I take it to. Right. So, what should be in that cover letter? Usually, I let, you know, if, there, if I have a personal connection to the company, I'll point that out in the cover letter. So, if someone says, you know, oh, I'm a. I'm a member of Women in Film and Video, and I'm on a committee with Hilary Shea, one of your producers, and she mentioned that you had a job opening. I want to know that. I want to know if you already know people in my company, because then I'll go and I'll ask that person about you. You better make sure that that person is going to speak positively. So before you cross-reference someone, make sure they actually like you, and learn how to read body language of I'm being polite versus I like you. And that's hard. I was a bartender. I'm good at body language. I can tell when people are drunk. Um, you want to make sure that you can you know, read that. You should also reference why you want the position in that. You know, I was very excited to see this. You know, you guys are well known for your motion graphics capabilities, and I really enjoy working in motion graphics. Uh, you know, I've included some samples of mine that seem to be a good fit. I've included two title sequences, as well as I noticed that you guys do a lot of work with animated photography. I've included a few of my images. I particularly liked such and such piece that I saw in your portfolio. I look forward to talking to you about that. You know, things like that where you show that you've actually researched the company. You have to realize if I'm bringing you in for a job interview, I've already spent an hour looking at your material. I'm going to spend an hour or two or more by the time I stop meeting with you. And I'm going to spend an hour talking about you. Do you know how much four hours of my time is worth? $1,200 to $1,700. 
you better damn well have a cover letter that tells me why you want the job or I'm not going to bother. Does that make sense? And if you start tossing in a couple of other people into an interview, I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars of billable time is being spent on interviewing you, which is why I hate interviews. Why I'm very, you know, we usually like take people out of our freelance pool because freelancers are simple. With a freelancer, it's very easy. It's like, oh, you look like you got the skills. You got a couple of references. Come on in. And we put you to work. And if you do a good job, we bring you in again. And if you've been here off and on for three months and we have an opening, you're the first person we're going to hire. Absolutely. Every single time. Three-fourths of the people who work at my company started as freelancers because they proved their worth and they showed that they were good. Rarely do we hire people out of job interviews. But I will make the freelancer go through a more formal interview, but it's a much shorter process because I want to ask them some hard questions. I want to make sure it's a good fit for the job and that we're going to match up. But it does happen that there are openings and sometimes we have to advertise. Like right now, unexpectedly, we're losing one of our graphic artists. His wife got a new job in New York. We have a graphic artist opening coming up. I'll be advertising. I got a couple of freelancers I'm going to consider, but you know, it's hard for us, to, you know, that's one of our positions where usually freelance graphic artists are more expensive than the ones we would hire for a staff position. So. Website advice. Keep it clean, keep it uncluttered, make sure it works on mobile. More than half of all people load websites through mobile devices, so WordPress is particularly good for this. If you're not comfortable with WordPress, WordPress.com, Squarespace, or Weebly. Those three services are all very good. They have themes, they're WYSIWYG, you can have your resume. Squarespace is probably the cleanest. Um, Squarespace is not good if you need to do commerce or plugins, but if you suck at web, Squarespace is probably the easiest to make a portfolio site out of. Weebly is a little cheaper. WordPress.com is inherently free. I would argue, however, that if you're going to be freelance or applying for jobs, having your own domain is pretty important. Okay. What do you put in that portfolio? You want to make sure that you have a good portfolio. Make sure it's got your resume, make sure you've got work samples. Keep it pretty clean and straightforward. There is no one-size-fits-all portfolio, but your portfolio needs to represent your body of work. So you need to pick work samples that are going to re resonate in that portfolio. So I'll put things in there that show diversity, but not everything. I don't need to see every single video or graphic design project you ever worked on. I might ask for some specific, have you ever done this? We do a lot of documentary editing. I see a couple of docs here in your reel. Do you have any more you can show me or can I see a full length one that you worked on? Oh yeah, sure, no problem. Let me log into my website here. Here it is and you can show me. So, you know, you might have 80 pieces on your Vimeo page and you can have them set to private even and then put them or call them up and send me a viewing link to show me more work samples. But don't put all 80 pieces on your portfolio page because you'll overwhelm me. So, you know, pick the 10 best pieces and then say additional work samples available. And then if I ask you, you show me. Does that make sense to everyone? Narrow it down. I'm in the process of purging a lot of stuff off our own site right now. You want to show diversity, and even if you only work on one type of project, try to have some variety. So you can do that by volunteering. You can do that by working on things like the 48-hour film project, or you can do that by joining uh, local uh, user groups who will sometimes do PSAs for nonprofits. You can get variety in your demo reel, even if you work at a job that only cuts videos for a... Uh, a makeup company. Well, you can still diversify by volunteering or doing independent projects. In your portfolio, get samples of work ideally done for real-world clients. And um, if you can't get that from real-world clients, then volunteer, do externships, work with nonprofits. You, if you are out of work, you can go to almost any nonprofit and simply say, hey, rather than sitting at home, I'd like to take 20 hours a week and do some media projects for you. My only requirements are you cover my hard costs and you tell me what those things are that you need, but I need, you know, for example, there's this and this. 
and that I'm allowed to put that into my portfolio and you'll provide me a positive reference. Almost all of them will say yes. Out of the portfolio is don't overload it. Make sure that you keep the less than stellar things out and you can get there by showing this to a peer and asking them to review your work and give you feedback. So you want to get your work reviewed and get some feedback. Now, you should update that portfolio frequently. No job is 100% secure. Okay? It's just the simple truth. And I knew a whole group of people that all just got laid off. They didn't know it was coming. Another TV network shut down in DC quite suddenly. Right? It's not like the management stands around the office saying, you know, things are getting a little tight. If I were you, maybe three months from now, you might want to start interviewing for jobs. Right? I've had this backfire on me. I had an employee that I really liked and things were getting tight. And I told her, you know, three months from now, things might be a little bit tight. You might want to start looking. And then, you know, she started looking and we still needed her. She found a better job. <laughs> so, so I've been retrained not to open my mouth until the last minute. Now, I've been lucky and I've never had to lay somebody off because of lack of work. I have had to fire people because of repeated mistakes or dishonesty, but I've never been in that position. But I don't envy people, and I know a lot of companies that have had to lay people off. So you want to have your work updated. You want to make sure you're ready for an interview or a proposal. And if it's been six months, log in and do it. Okay? Update it. Always take that time. And make sure that you're backing up copies of their work. I see a lot of people who get work samples and they have it on one hard drive, okay? It's not backed up if it doesn't exist in three places. Two mediums, one off-site. That means that you have two hard drives with it. Those hard drives need to be plugged in. If the hard drive's not plugged in, it's not powered. It's a giant electromagnet. It will lose things. If you're a student walking around with all your work samples in your book bag and it's stolen, you're screwed. I've seen some of my students back when I taught at the Art Institute lose their entire four-year history because every work for every class was on one hard drive and they were too frugal or poor to buy a hard drive. Now, I came back to a couple of those people and said, what do you mean you couldn't afford a hard drive? And I listed off a handful of things that I knew if better choices were made would have solved this. Cloud storage is cheap. Not necessarily fast, but you can put stuff up there. If your work doesn't exist backed up to a Dropbox, a Google Cloud, an Amazon S3 services, you're in trouble. CrashPlan is a great affordable backup service that you can upload. And I use Drobos, uh, where I can keep my stuff on multiple hard drives, and if a hard drive fails, it doesn't, it doesn't fall apart. So it has five hard drives in the case, two of the hard drives can fail without data loss. But one unit is still not backup, even if it's on a protected RAID, if that hard drive gets stolen or you knock a soda into the thing and fry the entire thing, you're in trouble. So two different places, two different drives, one in the cloud, and that's much safer. Okay? All right. Most of you probably came to Rod's class this week on demo reels. I don't want to go too deep on demo reels, but basically you need a demo reel to show your work. I recommend that your demo reel covers some of the high-level stuff. Make sure that it shows the type of work you're interested in and that it's really to the point, okay? So in that demo reel, you want to make sure that you show what you're interested in. Make sure people know what you're passionate about. Put some music in there. Make sure the music you have rights to. Don't use copyrighted music. If you need copyrighted music, there's a service called Song Freedom where you can license copyrighted music and it gives you a graphic that you can put at the end that shows that you paid the licensing fee. Song Freedom is great for small video producers or people doing demo reels. You can license popular music ranging from like $50 to $200 and like you can get that Imagine Dragons song that you want and get a real license and post it online and upload the license with it and not have your demo reel taken down. But if you use or steal music, the fines to me are enormous. $10,000 per offense, and a view is an offense. So if I hire you and you don't understand copyright, you're not getting a job. If you want to understand copyright, go to copyright.gov and copyright.org. And before you apply for jobs in this industry, understand copyright. 
or you are a huge liability and you won't get the job. All right. Additionally, let's talk about, jump forward a little bit here. So this is my friend Robbie's reel, and he's a colorist. Colorist reels are much slower, and they're always a montage, and they show variety. But he wants you to understand team player and you're not trying to take credit for work you didn't do. That's very important whenever you're promoting yourself or your work that you identify what your role was on the project. And if you're a student, chances are almost every single thing on your reel, if you're applying from a school that's in my area, I've already seen because it's the same media that other students worked on or it was a group project and I saw this before. So you better tell me I was the director or I was the editor on this. Mm -hmm. When I put you films, you films, you films. Yeah, and, and list it. Or if it was for, you might put who the client was, you know, if it was like a piece or the series name or anything else. So you can be more specific. If you don't want to just keep listing the same one over and over again, list the project title and list your role. But it shows that you're providing credit and you're acknowledging your role in the work. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you are applying for something like motion graphics, I may want to see your work. And I like breakdowns. So this is one of our breakdowns for an animated photo. And I show you, and you clearly can appreciate how we took a static painting and turned it into a 3D scene and layered in time lapse and then added in lighting and then <coughs> color graded it into a final piece. You might not appreciate just seeing the two second shot. But doing a breakdown and showing it to you works well. If you're really good at compositing your keying, break it down for me. Show me the finished piece, then do a breakdown and let me see it so I can appreciate your work. Okay? That goes a long way. Now, let's move past demo reels and talk about social media for a second. Clean up your social media before you apply for a job. Go through and get rid of stuff because employers will look. Now, if you don't show up on social media at all, it's worse to me because it means that you're hiding. Wow, you're a raging club person. You know, you go out all the time to nightclubs and party it up and you're hiding it. Yeah, you know, I want to see that you have a life. I want to see what you're interested in, but I don't want to see you being stupid because I don't want to, you know, have to worry about you. Keep it family friendly, but show your personality. Don't show too many flaws, but don't pat. Don't try to be like, and this weekend I'm volunteering at the soup kitchen, right? Like, you know, don't fake it. If that's what you do, then put it down there. But it better be balanced. And the ones that really matter are these three, okay? The others are fine. You can use all you want. But these are the only three your employer is going to care about. Facebook, because it's the number one platform. Twitter, because it's a thinking person's platform, and it shows the most connected, active people. And LinkedIn, because I could really check your references. Now, this is a simplistic graphic, but it's actually kind of true. And I'll let you just process that for a second. And uh, this tells you where things should be posted. If more people applied a filter to their lives, they would have less problems. I see a lot of people who are their own worst enemies, and it's important that a prospective employer gets an idea of who you are. Now, 
you can publish to outlets that are truly social, but in our industry, it's also a good idea to use some of these. So if you are into photography, I want to see your 500 pics account. I may look at you on Flickr or Instagram. If you want to be taken seriously, don't just post to Instagram, post to 500px. If you want to be taken seriously, don't send me to your YouTube channel, send me to your Vimeo channel, okay? Because people who post too much stuff to YouTube show me that they also have no understanding of copyright because every single thing you posted, you just gave up the rights to. Permanently, even if you take it down, you've given Google a sub-licensable permanent right to do whatever they want with the material you uploaded. That's why you need a Vimeo account. Now, one thing that's a challenge, and this is just a slight tri a trite quote, but it's true, is it's very easy to get overwhelmed. There's so much good stuff out there. There's so much bad stuff out there. You just don't know where to look. When you're applying for a job, your job is to present a realistic view of who you are, but let me see the best stuff. Don't overwhelm me. Or I can't process it. All right, let's talk about what you do before the interview. Before the job interview, you want to make sure to check your references. Check in with the people you're going to list. Make sure that the references know they might be getting a call. Ask them, if you're going to have them list you as a reference, what would you say my greatest strengths are? What would you say are some of my weaknesses? And if they don't want to do this face-to-face, -face, you can give them a written thing to fill out. You might think that college professor loved you, but they might remember that, you know, you never showed up on time. You're thinking, wait, that was freshman year. I've been on time for the last three years. But in their brain, you're the one who's always late to work. So you want to know what that reference is going to say about you, if at all possible. Okay? You can do this in a way like a strengths inventory. Like if there's criteria that you think are important or both positive and negative, you can ask them to rate you on a scale of one to five for your strengths and weaknesses. And you know, then they don't have to tell you to your face, but they might just go through really quickly and do it. This will help you know which references to list or if a reference is gonna be positive. I don't, want, I don't believe a reference who says they're awesome, they're the best one ever, that's the only one you should ever hire, they're absolutely perfect. No one believes that. You know, I wanna know. Yeah, they're more of an, you know, they're not that much of a morning person. All right, well, when we set their schedule, their start time will be 10.30. Yeah. In my line of work, I got flexibility. I'm not on air. So I can make people have different schedules. And you know, I've got employees who I'll say, what would you like your start time to be? So it's very funny. What do you mean? When do you want to come to work? Like, you're saying I could wait for a rush hour? Like, yeah. Like, 11? I said, no problem. Great. And I said, all right, so eight hours plus a half hour lunch break, so you'll be done at 7.30 at night. Is that okay? I don't want to work that late. So you want to come in at 10.30? Oh, okay. You know, like, that. you know, I, I've had people not realize, like, they somehow think that, like, we work nine to five, and if you come in late, you still leave at five, and you get a paid hour for lunch. It doesn't happen in this industry. Good luck. So you want to go through. Also, check your network. We mentioned the social network, but also check in. Chances are that you might have some connections in the company already. Some people you work with or know might know people in that company and they could put a word in on your behalf. They can advocate for you. They can also say, whoa, don't apply there. Those guys are always advertising that job. They chew through people like bubble gum. You know? Oh, don't take that internship. We had a bunch of students who just said that, you know, they never got any good experience out of that. All they did was did work unsupervised and you know, they were basically used for their labor. They never got a chance to shadow or work with others in a group. They were just cutting things, working from eight o'clock at night to 2 a.m. And you know, it was just boring stuff. They didn't learn anything. This is why we research the company. You wanna find out, you know, take a look at their website. Take a look at their social media profiles. Try to figure out who some of their key employees are. My favorite is when people come in and interview for a job in my company and I see demo material and assets that they did out of one of my books or lynda.com classes. And they don't even put two and two together and they're telling me how awesome they are and they're showing me assets that my company made. Happens, it's happened a lot actually. 
We got people who come in and they don't know what we do. On the flip side, I got to tell you, like when people come in and they've got a scouting background, they figure out that I got a scouting background. I got a soft spot for people with a gold award or an Eagle Scout because I'm a Boy Scout leader and a Girl Scout leader. And I know how much work it took to get that. And I know that they're probably able to finish something and that I could probably trust them to be in a room talking to people because they'll be polite. I've got biases and that's okay. It's my company. I don't work for the government. I can hire fairly as long as I don't bias against people and say, oh, you know, I didn't hire so-and-so because of this reason, because of their gender or their race. But their unique qualifications and past awards are totally valid criteria. I look for people who tended bar or waited tables. You want to know why? Because they know that their earning is directly tied to keeping other people happy and their ability to put up with shit is a lot higher than people who just went to film school, right? Film schools people spit out crap. People who wait in service industries know how to take it. Now, I'm not saying that film school's bad. Film school's awesome. But if you went to film school and you worked in a bar, I know that you can work on a set and that you won't crack under pressure. So it's things like that. Look for top management. Look if they've won any awards. See what they're good at. And also research the position. What does this job actually entail, right? What is it about this job that you're gonna to have to do? Are there any skills you need? So if you get a call for the job interview, it might be you know, a week from now. Can you log in to lynda.com or thinktaplearn and brush up on some skills? If you're gonna be applying for a Premiere Pro editing position and you've been doing Avid at your last job, but you show up and show that you've, got, you've completed the essentials course with your certificate and you've brushed up on the latest features, you say, wow, I'm really looking forward to getting back to Premiere Pro. You know, I've been editing on the side with it. My current employer is Avid, but I know you use Premiere Pro here. You know, you can figure that stuff out about most companies before you show up. If you even try, you want to know how? You can just look and see who works there. Oh, these people are editors. Let's look them up on LinkedIn. Oh, they're friends with so-and-so. Let me ask so-and-so what they edit with over there so I can prepare. You could totally do detective work easily. Don't show up and say, so what do you guys cut on here? <laughs> hey, Hilly? The question to start off. <laughs> yeah, not a good question to start off. It shows that you did zero homework. Especially in my case, it's like, oh, I don't know. Why don't you type in Richard Harrington and see what book comes up? It's not that hard. Oh, you wrote the classroom in a book on Premiere Pro? I bet you edit with Premiere Pro at your shop. It's not that hard to figure out. Most companies even have it on their website. So you want to know what you're applying for. Another thing that I recommend, and people screw this one up all the time, physically visit the location before the day of your interview. Now, don't break an entry. Don't pretend that you're the FedEx guy and take a look around. I'm not saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is drive to the location at the time of day you're going to drive. Don't go there at like 8 o'clock at night and then, you know, oh, the day of the 9 a.m. interview, like, oh, that'll take like an hour to get there. And then you're stuck in traffic. Right? Like whatever time you think it's going to take on the day of the interview, double it and leave super early. And what I typically would do is I would send an email saying, you know, you know, thank, I'm looking very forward to our interview today. Uh, I just left. I'm about to leave the house and I'm heading on over. If there's any change in time, please call my cell phone. I won't be checking email. I look forward to meeting you. That way they know that I left way early for the interview. Better that you're sitting across the place having a cup of coffee or that you're there waiting. Don't sit on the front porch. Don't sit in the lobby. Rather, just visit the location and know where it's at and be ready. You want to know what it takes to get there. You want to know what the commute is like. I've got people who apply for jobs. Like, I don't know if any of you are from the Washington, D.C. area, but like, if you have to cross a river, it adds 45 minutes. So if you're coming from Maryland to Virginia, you've added 45 minutes. If the commute is going to be more than 30 minutes a day for you, I'm going to seriously say this to you. Are you prepared to, are, are you able to relocate for this job? Well, no, I really like my apartment. So you're going to commute an hour and a half each way every day? Yeah. Do you know what? I'm not going to hire you. Not that I don't appreciate that you like your apartment. You might say, well, my kids are in school and I need to let them finish out the, the year you know, and I have to talk with my wife about it or my husband about it, but you know, we might be able to move a little closer. You've bought a house, I'm not gonna ask you to relocate, but I am gonna say flat out, you know, 
How are you going to deal with three hours of commuting a day? Because your days as an employee are very short when you have those awful commutes. You can also do mock interviews ahead of time. Get some peers, get some colleagues, your school, people you know, friends in other industries to sit down and do some dress rehearsal interviews. Put on the clothes, put your resume out there, and rehearse. Have them ask the questions. Practice explaining who you are and what you care about and why you should be hired. Every time you do an interview, you get better at interviewing. So why blow this on the first couple of interviews you had by being rusty? Do some fake interviews. When you show up, make sure you have multiple copies of everything. Show up with copies of your resume. Show up with your demo reel in two different formats. Oh, here's a DVD and a USB thumb drive. Or, hey, I've got my URL saved so I can load it on my laptop, but I also backed up the files so I could play them off of my hard drive if I can't get an internet connection. Extra business cards electronic versions of things that can be downloaded and shared. Make sure it's easy to get to. I also recommend that you be bulletproof because what's going to happen is frequently you'll show up for a job interview and you won't be able to access the internet. Particularly if you're dealing with a corporation or government agency or a larger group, you won't have access once you're within the organization to publicly available internet. And you might have interference or a very slow connection if you're trying to use your data plan. So the solution is take screenshots, download, and have physical media. And again, USB 3, not a DVD or a Blu-ray disc. No one has DVD players or Blu-ray players anymore. It is a dead, failed technology that no one uses. Don't bother putting your demo reel on it. Make a USB 3 thumb drive. You can buy these cheap and in bulk. USB 2 is too slow to play back video effectively. Okay. All right. Before we go forward, any questions on anything I've said so far? These are all strong opinions, but I'm just trying to tell you like what I would look for if you were applying for a job with me. And I talked to 10 different employers who are colleagues to run this past them. So this is my opinions and other opinions from 10 other folks. So if I sound wacky, it's because we've been driven crazy by bad people. Yes? You mentioned that um, not just put your stuff up on YouTube because you know, copyright is a big thing and sometimes you can't that. Vimeo is a paid service, so when you take something down, it comes down. Yeah. Vimeo, you maintain your copyright. Technically, you're not giving YouTube your copyright, but you're giving them a sub licensable, transferable, worldwide license to do whatever they want with your content. So you're still the copyright holder, but you've granted them a license in perpetuity to do whatever they want to that piece of content or give it to anyone else without your permission. But you're still the copyright holder. You just have no control whatsoever, forever. So that's kind of like saying you're married, but your significant other sleeps in another house and does whatever they want to do, and they never come around or do anything, but you still legally have to put up with them. Oddly enough, we're on copyright. Hey, so don't be a liability. Don't steal music. Don't sample or use work samples without permission. Make sure that you have permission for those work samples. Always attribute your sources and be correct. So here's a few resources on copyright. So ASMP, American Society of Media Photographers, now Media Professionals, has a huge library on copyright and tutorials. Um, ASMP is a great place to look at. Copyright.gov is another great place. And uh, if you're not in the US, the World Inter Intellectual Property Organization, uh, WIPO.int is quite useful. You need to understand copyright if you work in this industry. Now, when you put those work samples together, I love this quote, okay? There are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take credit. Try to be in the first group as there's far less competition there. I need to know what you did. Don't tell me how awesome you are. Don't pad your resume. If it was a group project, tell me it was a group project. If you worked with some other awesome people, tell me their names. If you did work for a company, tell them that work that you did. Make sure that you're transparent. All right, so now you're at the job interview. First up, how do you dress? Well, research the company. If you show up 
and you are overdressed, you're going to stand out. It's better to be slightly overdressed than underdressed, but here's my solution. When I have to go into a company cold, I'll wear a suit. I'm a guy. I'll wear a colored shirt underneath, something like this, you know, or a brightly colored shirt as opposed to a starched white shirt. I might have a tie on, and I have the coat. And I could very quickly determine if I should take the tie off and wear the jacket, or if I should go without a jacket, or what I can do. So you can be dressed in layers so you can be more casual. Blue jeans are never going to fit, even if they are all wearing blue jeans when they interview you. But find a balance. You know, don't show up in a three-piece suit with no conversion ability. We're not an industry of starched white shirts for the most part. You're applying for a government job, maybe. Favor clean but not flashy. Tone down the jewelry. Not to share too much information. I have a handful of body piercings. I always leave my earrings in. I don't emphasize the fact that I've got a couple of tattoos. You know, you dress the part. I have hired two women with pink hair in the last three years. I'm an exception. I'm okay with pink. I had a producer with pink hair, although she grew out of it now. Four years later, she got rid of the pink. And we have a graphic designer with neon pink hair. It's okay. She's a graphic designer. <laughs> no, I expect it. So, but not everybody's cool with that. My, even my own colleague is like, she's got pink hair. I'm like, dude, she's applying for a design position. That's a good thing. She's got pink hair. <laughs> yeah. You know, it bothered him, but I have seniority. <laughs> when should you arrive? When you arrive, make sure that, you know, in our industry, on time equals late. So if your interview is at 4 o'clock and you walk in at 4 o'clock, you're late. Show up. 15 minutes to the parking lot early. Make sure you're at the parking lot 15 minutes early so that you have time to find a parking spot. If the parking lot's full, you know where to park. Make sure you can get through security. If you did that location scout ahead of time, you saw that there's security, you had to get a badge, all of those things are there. So make sure you're early. If you are running late, call before you're late. I've always seen said to people, you had no idea you were going to be late until you were late. You know, like if traffic is awful and you left the house, you might call ahead and say, hey, I've been on the road for 30 minutes already. There appears to have been an accident on the beltway. I'm getting off. I'm taking an alternate route. I might be a little bit late. I'll update you as I get closer, but I just wanted you to know. Okay. When you're there, be prepared that you might be there the whole day. Don't double book yourself if you get an interview. Don't schedule one for the morning and one for the afternoon if you can avoid it. Now this is hard, particularly if you're trying to sneak this in and you're applying at places with other employers. You know, you might have to say, you know, I apologize, I don't want to be dishonest with my current employer, can we meet after hours? Can I come in early? Can we meet on a weekend? Can we do a phone interview during my lunch break? Can we meet somewhere uh, during my lunch break? You know, if you're being honest with your current employer or you know, they've told you you're being laid off, then you can come back and say, I need a day off for a personal day. But if you're oddly asking for personal days randomly with short notice, I know you're looking for a job. It's obvious. Be prepared, though, for multiple people to interview you. You might be there for a while because you might get passed from one person to another to another. We'll typically, if there's somebody we intend to hire, have them meet with all three execs of the company independently, then bring you back together and pair you up with one or two people that are going to be your coworkers so they can say if they think they can stand you or not. They're looking at you to decide that if they think that they could be a coworker of yours or if they find you annoying. Now, you might think that sounds unfair, but in an office of only 17 people, if you piss everyone else off, you're a bad hire. If you're obnoxious, you're a bad hire. So you don't want to seem rushed. And when you arrive, make sure you're well fed. Don't show up hungry. Don't expect that they're going to feed you at lunchtime. Don't come in with food on your face. Eat before you get there. Eat before you put on your interview clothes. Don't go through the McDonald's drive through rushing to the job interview and inhale food. Eat a good, healthy meal before you get there. You don't want your stomach growling in the middle of the job interview. And you don't want to say stupid things. Now, I will typically toss in, if I'm going to like, I'm not doing job interviews, but if I'm going to do like client meetings, I will have some candy bars for quick sugar. I'll have some jerky in my thing. And you can slip a candy bar in your hand or have one in your coat pocket and 
excuse yourself to the bathroom and inhale some calories and come back. Those Snickers commercials of you're not you when you're hungry are actually pretty true. Comedic, but true. What else should you bring? Show up with note-taking materials. I can't tell you how less I think of you if you come to a job interview and you're not taking notes. Everybody who works for me takes notes. I talk fast, they write down notes. And I expect it to be not electronic. I recommend that you write it down rather than you're typing it because it's much quieter to take a few notes during your job. You should have backup copies of notes. You should have your resume, your references. You should come with a list of questions about our company that you want to know about us. If you're going for a job interview, the best job interviews are when you get the employer talking 60% of the time. When you show interest in them and that you've done your research and you want that job and you're interested in having a conversation about them, people like to talk about themselves. They'll think you're the best candidate ever just because you expressed interest in their line of work. Now, it better be genuine. If you did that research and you thought the company sounded boring, don't apply for the job. If you're not going to be happy there, don't apply for the job. It is better to apply for five jobs you want than 50 jobs you know little about and don't want. Okay. I have gotten over half the jobs I've ever applied for. I haven't had to apply in a long time, but I've gotten over half. Okay. The reason why is because I made sure I was a good fit for the work, and it was a job I actually wanted to do. So when they see that, then you become an immediate finalist for the position. Do not bring games. Do not sit in the lobby in front of the receptionist checking your social media. I have had to fire employees for being addicted to social media. We've had employees whose job it is to post to social media. That's one thing. We had an editor who had multiple complaints from clients about constantly checking Facebook during editing sessions. We warned her. We made it part of her job interview or her performance review. We warned her again. We then installed child security software and recorded her screen and played back a week of her work as a time lapse and in five minutes Facebook boom 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 like every 15 minutes Facebook was popping up you know this is a time lapse it was like one continuous flicker of Facebook on her second screen well I'm still working it was rendering the effect like I don't care when you're rendering the filter you turn around and you talk to the client about the project you don't fire open Facebook and check something you're there a hundred percent for them Every minute is for them. If they leave the room or you're on your lunch break, I don't care what you do on your lunch break, but you don't do it there. So if you show up on social media or I see your phone, I think you're distracted. Put the phone away, okay? Don't bring gifts either. That sends a very wrong message and can get you into trouble. During the interview, maintain eye contact. It's very important. Make sure you maintain eye contact with everyone in the room. If you are a man and you only look at the other men in the room, you will not get the job. If you are a woman and you only look at the other women in the room or you ignore the women in the room and favor the men, you won't get the job. You need to maintain eye contact with everyone and deliberately make sure you turn occasionally and choose someone to talk to. And then look back to someone else and say, well, what do you think about that? Don't just play ping pong or tennis match, but make sure you communicate. With those questions being ready, this is going to work. People like to talk about themselves. So ask intelligent questions. Ask about their business practices. Ask about, you know, the growth of the company. Ask about things about them. What motivates them to come to work? What was one of their most favorite projects they worked on? Hey, I saw these projects on your webpage. You know, which of these did you like the most? Or what type of projects do you guys enjoy doing here? You know, what skills does someone really need to be successful here? Does the company promote from within, right? These are things. Another thing to think about is preparing for the unexpected. The employer may cancel the job interview. There's a good chance that they'll run late. It's just like the dentist office or the doctor's office. That's why I say don't double book yourself. Again, I've had people who I would have hired who, because they were double booked or didn't allow enough time, canceled the interview on their end because we were running an hour late. And they didn't get the job, and they could have. If you've got short tenure at a job, make sure you can explain why. If you have gaps in your employment, make sure you can explain why. Hey, I had a sick parent, I need to take off some time. 
hey, I got unexpectedly laid off. My entire department was shut down. And yeah, I've been looking for a job for three months, but in order to keep my skills up, I've also been volunteering at my church, working on the Sunday productions and doing the, the telestreaming there. And I've been doing some volunteer work here while I've been looking for work. You know, fill that in with something, not I've been at home watching The Walking Dead. Make sure you have something. Also, always know your long-term goals. Most employees will typically last three to five years. So I want to know what you want to do. I want to know what you are going to make you happy so I can see if you're a good fit or not. And please don't come in with delusions of grandeur. Okay? You are not an expert. You have core skills. You are not a director or a DP. You've probably been a crew member. Now, if you are a director or a DP and you've got 20 years experience, I'll believe you. You're out of school for five years, you're not a DP, okay? Don't boast, but show me what you're proud of and make sure you identify the role in your project. Don't ask me about stock options. That's happened 10 times in my career and I've laughed out loud every single time. You mean this company I've spent 17 years building and that I've made sacrifices for my family and everything else? No, sorry, doesn't happen. Don't ask about vacation time. When you get your offer letter, it will be in there. If it's not in there, then ask. You know, it's okay in this day and age to just say, you know, with my offer letter, is there information about your benefits plans here? I've got a family to provide for and I just want to make sure that I can review those. Oh yeah. Or which medical provider is your insurance plan with? That's an okay question. But don't ask me about vacation time and time off on your job interview. Sends the wrong message. Also, be prepared for low-end work. That first job that I almost lost, it was because I didn't pay attention to the details. I had a crappy job of having to go in and file away commercials and on a card catalog, write down the information about the commercial and file it away. I screwed up through a couple of things. And what my employer said is, if I can't trust you with the small stuff, how can I trust you with the big stuff? So it became pretty important that we got it right. All right. So... Let's just sort of evaluate this here. Um, things that matter. There are a lot of choices to the employer. There's a lot of things and people competing for those jobs. It's a distance race, not a speed race. So you need to be in it for the long haul and you need to be humble. You need to be outgoing. We're in a creative industry. Sorry. <laughs> this is probably somebody calling. Here you go. It's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. I have three minutes left in my class, and then I'm coming to your booth. I will make you look good. Bye, Michelle. Bye. I've got to hang up. Bye. <laughs> That's the person at Adobe wondering where I am. And we have to be truthful and be a team player. If you're not, you're not going to get the job. All right? When the interview is done, ask about the next steps. Make sure you know what the timeline is to hire. Make sure you know if they're going to be hiring people right away or if there's a big delay. And that's pretty much it. After the interview, follow up, send a thank you note so they know, send an electronic thank you note, send a physical thank you note, a written letter. I get about two pieces of mail a day at the office. I get about 800 emails a day. Send a physical thank you note. It will go a lot further, okay? Don't send any gifts, you'll get in trouble. And make sure your references know that people are going to check your references. So the parting advice is this. There is always somebody out there who will work for less money than you. There is always somebody out there who has more talent than you. There is always somebody out there who is smarter than you. But there is nobody out there who has the exact same combination of skills or who is as passionate as you and wants the job as much as you. So when given the choice, people will do business with people they like and respect. So the bottom line is to be nice, be real, and be yourself, but show that you want that job, and the chances of getting it are that much higher.